Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Sabia Gatti. I'm a consultant cardiologist at the Brompton and I work with the IACH. I'll be chairing this afternoon's session. Unfortunately, Professor Matt Wilson can't be with us today. We have a great lineup of speakers who cover the investigations, the management and the recommendations for competitive sports in athletes with arrhythmias and abnormal imaging. I would encourage you all to place your questions in the chat box and I'll do my best to direct your questions to the speakers in our panel discussion later on this afternoon. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. He needs no introduction. He is the world expert in sports cardiology. He runs the largest sports cardiology unit in the UK. He's been absolutely pivotal to the first set of ESC guidelines in sports cardiology and exercise in patients with cardiovascular diseases. Professor Sanjay Sharma will be speaking on athletes with arrhythmias. Sanjay. Hello, everyone. My name is Sanjay Sharma, and I'm going to be speaking to you about arrhythmias in athletes. The benefits of exercise on the cardiovascular system are well established. Exercise curbs risk factors for atherosclerosis, and by doing so, it reduces the risk of an adverse event from a myocardial infarction by about 50% in individuals in their fifth and sixth decade. Exercise also improves cardiovascular fitness, which is an objective marker of longevity, and people who exercise live five to seven years longer than sedentary individuals. Participation in regular exercise is associated with a constellation of adaptations, which include a slow heart rate, enlarged cardiac dimensions, and peak oxygen consumption. But exercise also promotes physiological bradyarrhythmias due to increased vagal tone. It may create a substrate for arrhythmogenesis, or may even provoke fatal arrhythmias in individuals with underlying cardiovascular disease. But I should emphasize that moderate exercise is actually beneficial in reducing the risk of atrial fibrillation and ventricular arrhythmias. In this large biobank study of over 400,000 people, those individuals that exercise in accordance with the current recommendations or up to three times more than the current recommendations reduce their risk of atrial fibrillation by five to 15 percent and their risk of ventricular arrhythmias by 11 to 22 percent. And this benefit was much greater in women. If we look at the most common arrhythmia, that is atrial fibrillation, people with atrial fibrillation who exercise regularly reduce their risk of cardiovascular morbidity by 12% and cardiovascular mortality by 15%. But athletes do get physiological rhythm disturbances, such as sinus bradycardia, Mobitz type 1 second degree AV block, nodal bradycardia, or even sinus pauses of between three and five seconds, usually under three seconds in the day and up to five seconds when they're in their sleep. And these are normal and they're due to high vagal tone and don't usually require any assess investigation in asymptomatic people. Here's an example of an asymptomatic cyclist with a slow heart rate. And you'll see down here that there is a progressive increase in PR interval followed by the fourth P wave, which fails to conduct. And this is Mobitz type one second degree AV block that may pre be present in up to 25% of endurance athletes. And this will resolve with some bedside exercise, such as running on the spot. Here's another athlete who is completely asymptomatic. And you'll see the first complex shows a relatively short PR interval. In the second complex, the P wave is buried in the QRS complex, suggesting that it's coming from around the nodal region. In the, in the rest of the complexes, you will see that there are no P waves at all. And this is nodal rhythm. Again, this resolves with gentle exercise. So athletes are also prone to pathological rhythm disturbances, just like the general population. And some may get atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, or atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia, ventricular extrasystoles, and ventricular tachycardia. Now, it's highly unlikely that most of you will see athletes with ventricular tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia unless you work in the A&E department. So I'd like to focus on some of the most common rhythm disturbances that you will encounter in your clinical practice. And these are atrial fibrillation and ventricular extrasystole. So the rest of my talk will be focused on those, these two rhythm anomalies. Let's talk about atrial fibrillation, which is the most common arrhythmia uh, in, in the general population, and it's, it's usually 
got an age-related prevalence, much more prevalent in people in their 80s. It's an arrhythmia that we take quite seriously because it's associated with a two-fold increase in all-cause mortality, a three-fold increase in heart failure, and a five-fold increase in stroke. Over the past 15 years, several studies have shown that the risk of atrial fibrillation is five-fold greater in middle-aged endurance athletes. And the sort of athletes that develop atrial fibrillation are usually males aged between 40 and 60 years old who engage in endurance sports such as long distance running or cycling. These individuals are usually tall, they have higher blood pressure responses to exercise, and most of them have exercised uh, for around 1500 hours over a lifetime or more. Some studies have also shown that 21 years of cumulative exercise also increases the risk of atrial fibrillation. So what are the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation in athletes? The main substrate appears to be atrial stretch, hypertrophy of the myocytes, atrial dilatation, atrial inflammation, and atrial fibrosis. These are the substrates that promote atrial fibrillation in athletes. There are modulators, which includes increased vagal tone. Increased vagal tone shortens the refractory period of the atria and can promote atrial fibrillation. Gastroesophageal reflux may cause irritation of the atria and also promote atrial fibrillation. Genetic susceptibility must factor in, as must performance-enhancing drugs. But the trigger for atrial fibrillation in these individuals appears to be an increase in pulmonary vein activity which sets off atrial fibrillation. When we look at the actual risk between the two sexes, we find that most of the data examining atrial fibrillation has focused on males. Amongst males, moderate physical activity protects from atrial fibrillation, whereas intensive exercise increases the risk of atrial fibrillation by threefold. Things are different in females. This is data uh, pooled from 150,000 females, which showed that moderate physical activity reduced the risk of atrial fibrillation by 8.4%. Intensive exercise reduced it by a further uh, 20 odd percent. So basically people who exercise, women who exercise intensively reduce their risk by 28%, quite different to the story with male athletes. So women seem to be protected from atrial fibrillation if they exercise intensively. So what are the clinical manifestations of atrial fibrillation in athletes? Based on my experience, atrial fibrillation usually occurs at rest, usually wakes athletes from their sleep. Athletes are usually very symptomatic if they try to exercise during exercise because they've lost 25% of their cardiac output. Atrial contraction contributes to 25% of cardiac output. And of course, if you lose that, uh, an athlete will feel quite, sense, uh, quite uh, symptomatic. It's often sensed as a marked reduction of functional capacity during an attempt at training. And the atrial fibrillation can last anything between seconds and over 48 hours at a time. In my experience, it's not usually precipitated by exercise, but some of our athletes uh, can develop atrial fibrillation during exercise. So how do we assess and manage athletes with atrial fibrillation? Well, we go back to the adage that we should treat them the same as the general population to some extent. We should respect the fact that atrial fibrillation is not a benign arrhythmia. It's associated with a five-fold increase in the risk of stroke, a three-fold history, a hit risk in, in heart failure, and a two-fold risk of cardiac mortality. And there are several causes. Clearly, physical, active, physical hyperactivity is one cause, but you'll see, looking at this slide, alcohol consumption, obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, valvular heart disease, or silent coronary artery disease can all cause atrial fibrillation. So it's very important that when we're assessing an athlete for atrial fibrillation, we go through all of these potential risk factors, inquiring about alcohol history, inquiring about performance enhancing agents, looking at the family history of iron channel diseases or cardiomyopathy. Of course, we can't obviously ask this directly, but you may be wanting to ask about a history of premature cardiac disease or sudden cardiac death. It's unusual for athletes younger than they, the age of 30 to develop atrial fibrillation, but I am seeing it more and more commonly, particularly in our Olympiads. But when we do see that, we do try to look for other genetic conditions that may promote AF, but also promote sudden cardiac death. Always assess the blood pressure, 
exclude hyperthyroidism, and assess cardiac structure and function with the minimum of an echocardiogram. We should always perform a risk assessment for systemic thromboembolism uh, with the chance mass score, which I'll go through very quickly later on. And in people who've got persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation who don't feel too bad with it, we like to assess the ventricular rate response and to check for ischemia uh, before prescribing exercise. Clearly, if someone's got an inappropriately high ventricular rate during exercise, uh, then we might want to treat that with drugs. And if someone develops ischemia during exercise, we might want to investigate that with a coronary angiogram. The aims of managing atrial fibrillation ideally are to restore rhythm. Most athletes that I see have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and have only been in that rhythm for one or two days, sometimes less. And in that situation, we want to try and restore sinus rhythm, either chemically using drugs such as uh, flecainide. We may want to do that electrically if it's gone on for quite a long time, that's the atrial fibrillation. And in people who continue to have atrial fibrillation, uh, one could consider pulmonary vein ablation to try and terminate the rhythm for several years. In people, who have decided not to have uh, a restoration of sinus rhythm or in whom we have not been able to restore sinus rhythm, sinus rhythm, we may want to control rate. And we can do this with drugs such as beta blockers or AV nodal blockers such as calcium channel blockers. We want to reduce their risk of systemic thromboembolism. And we want to treat any precipitating factors such as asking them to abstain, abstain from excess alcohol or treating high blood pressure. So this is the chance mass score. I'm not going to go that, through that in much detail, but if someone's got a score of more than one, they should be anticoagulated to reduce their risk of systemic thromboembolism. Let's look at the natural history of atrial fibrillation and, and atrial flutter in that sense. So if an athlete presents with infrequent paroxysms of atrial fibrillation, you know that if they continue to exercise as they are doing, those paroxysms will become more frequent and then they will develop persistent atrial fibrillation. For athletes who present with infrequent paroxysms of atrial flutter, if they continue to exercise, these uh, paroxysms may become much more frequent. Even if we ablate their atrial flutter, there is still a risk that they may develop atrial fibrillation. So when patients come to see me with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is often the situation, I try to exclude an underlying cause. Uh, I try to, I certainly make an assessment of their risk of cerebrovascular accident with view to prescribing anticoagulants. And the one thing I do uh, ask them to do is to reduce their physical training. That's the volume and intensity by about 20%. Now there is no science behind this. This is just a figure I've pulled out of the air. It, it, it manages the athlete's expectation. It's very hard to tell someone who's been exercising all their life to cut down significantly. So I think cutting down by a fifth seems practical and it appears to work. Some athletes will continue to get occasional episodes of atrial fibrillation that may last for more than 30 minutes. In that situation, we have something called the pill in the pocket approach where the athlete stops doing any exercise. If the AF has gone on for 30 minutes or more, they take flecainide, usually at a dose of 100 milligrams and wait for two to four hours. If the atrial fibrillation persists, I normally advise them to take another 100 milligrams of flecainide and if it still persists two hours later, I usually advise them to attend the accident and emergency department. I don't like an athlete to remain in atrial fibrillation for more than two days because it makes things complicated with anticoagulation. Because once someone's been in atrial fibrillation for over 48 hours, we are obliged to anticoagulate that patient and can only cardiovert them uh, with either TOE assessment to make sure there's no clot in the, in the atrial appendage or leave them on anticoagulations for three weeks before attempting cardioversion. Now here you see atrial fibrillation, where you see that there is an irregular RR interval. And the inexperienced eyes may look at these little positive blips in V1 and think that this is atrial flutter. But these are just F waves because they are chaotic and they're disorganized. So always look at leads like V4 and V5. And you will see that you see no P waves in leads V4 and V5, and this should tell you that you're dealing with AF, no P waves, and an irregular RR interval. This is what flutter looks like. So a sawtooth sort of P wave pattern, a very, very, uh, it's, it's not chaotic like AF. The RR intervals aren't all over the place. And the reason I want to show you this is that although we use the pill in the pocket approach 
in atrial fibrillation, you should be strongly advised not to use the pill in the pocket approach in individuals with atrial flutter because flecainide promotes one-to-one -one conduction in people with atrial flutter, which can degenerate into ventricular flutter and ventricular fibrillation. So the treatment of atrial flutter in athletes who intend to exercise vigorously generally is an ablation because ablation works very, very well in atrial flutter and has an excellent success rate. We should still warn these individuals that there is a risk that they will develop atrial fibrillation if they continue to exercise. So once the ablation has occurred, they should curb the amount of exercise they're doing by at least 20%. So the management of uh, atrial fibrillation in master athletes with paroxysmal AF is, to, is, is as follows. Apart from off, after you've done the pill in the pocket approach, if they continue to get atrial fibrillation, then one should be discussing pulmonary vein ablation and this should be shared decision-making. You should be listening to what the athlete wants and also giving the athlete the pros and cons of pulmonary vein isolation. It is certainly recommended in the guidelines that they should be considered for pulmonary vein isolation. But I should just mention that there are a few data and, um, and the studies looking at pulmonary vein isolation in athletes are small, they're non-randomized and non-blinded. Athletes often require multiple procedures for success. Success after multiple procedures is usually less than 85%. We don't have much data about the success rate of atrial fibrillation beyond three years. And I'm very honest with my athletes to say this may keep you in sinus rhythm for three years, but I can't promise you about whether you'll still be in, in sinus rhythm after many years. We should talk to them about, about uh, talk to the athlete about the small risk of uh, complications during uh, uh, an atrial fibrillation ablation, such as stroke or cardiac perforation, and also tell them that despite the ablation, they might still want to cut back on the amount of exercise they're doing. So what are the recommendations for exercise? If, if an athlete has asymptomatic, asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, they've got a structurally normal heart, and if we exercise them, the heart rate response is not too bad in atrial fibrillation. If their chance of score is less than two, they can compete in all sports. Clearly, if an athlete has got a chance vas score of more than one, they need to be anticoagulated and such athletes should avoid all collision sport or sports associated with dangerous falls. When I'm dealing with a cyclist, you know, although it's not a collision sport, there is a high risk of terrible injury if they fall on their heads at 40 miles an hour coming down the hill. So clearly this becomes a bit of a complication in an anticoagulated athlete. I'd like now like to switch my attention to ventricular extrasystoles. Ventricular premature beats or extrasystoles are detected on the halter monitor in 40 to 80% of the general population. Frequent ventricular extrasystoles or complex ventricular extrasystoles, by this I mean couplets or triplets, are present in one to 4% of the general population. There is certainly limited data to suggest that athletes have a higher frequency of ventricular extrasystoles than the control population. I have yet to read a study that suggests that. Uh, there's no evidence for it at the moment. But athletes may experience ventricular premature beats or extrasystoles due to various benign reasons, such as stress, lack of sleep, excess caffeine, alcohol, performance enhancing agents, maybe even using recreational drugs, or an ectopic electrical focus. Now, clearly we can deal with these by lifestyle advice and, and, and this may be safe. But ventricular extrasystoles may also be suggestive of underlying cardiac inflammation, scar or granuloma, as in the case of sarcoid, abnormal cardiac hypertrophy or ion channel diseases. So on the one side, we've got benign situations and on the other side, we've got conditions that may promote sudden cardiac death. And one's got to decide whether the ventricular extrasystoles that you're dealing with are benign or whether they're harbingers of a potentially sinister heart condition. So how do we identify what's normal and what's not abnormal? Well, first we look at the morphology of the ventricular ectopic beats. Here is data from Italy on 5,000 athletes without cardiac disease who had an exercise stress test. Around 7% of these athletes showed at least one ectopic beat during exercise, and 0.7%, I'm sure this is, a, this is an un underestimate, showed more than 10 ventricular premature beats. 
And if we look at the morphology of the uh, ventricular premature beats, we find that 68% of athletes had ventricular extrasystoles arising from the right ventricular outflow tract. 15% had ventricular extrasystoles arising from the left ventricular fascicle. And 9% of athletes had extrasystoles arising from the left ventricular outflow tract. There were no events of Ramine follow-up of 7.4 years. So this is what extrasystoles coming from the right ventricular outflow tract look like. They conduct with left bundle branch bolt morphology, which is best appreciated in lead v V1, a broad co QRS complex with a negative deflection. And because they're coming from the outflow tract, the electricity travels downwards. So we have an inferior axis or extreme right axis deviation. This is what right ventricular outflow tract focus ectopics look like. And they are generally considered to be benign in individuals without symptoms or a family history of cardiac disease. Now, this is a bit, uh, this is a bit too cardiac, so you can ignore some of what I'm saying now. We look at V1 and V2. If the R wave does not become dominant in V2, it's possible that the ectopic focus may even be coming from the left ventricular outflow tract. What about fascicular ventricular premature beats? Now, these conduct with narrow right bundle branch block as ringed here. So you can see that in V1. The QRS duration for fascicular beats is between 110 and 130 milliseconds. If the axis is leftward, they're arising from the left posterior fascicle. If the axis is rightward, they're arising from the left anterior fascicle. And these are benign. So outflow tract ectopics and fascicular beats are usually benign. What about athletes with very frequent ventricular extrasystoles? Here's another study from Italy in a very large number of almost 16,000 young athletes where 355, that is 2.2%, had more than three extrasystoles on the resting ECG, that's a lot, or had palpitations. These were all investigated with echo, CMR, angiography, some even underwent an endomyocardial biopsy, and 7% of these athletes were diagnosed with cardiac diseases, which include, included mitral valve prolapse, myocarditis, ARVC, and DCM. So they divided these athletes into group A. These are people with more than 2,000 extrasystoles or non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on the halter. Group B, people who had between 100 and 2,000 ventricular extrasystoles. And group C, people who had less than 100 extrasystoles. And it was those athletes that had the most extrasystoles or non-sustained ventricular tachycardia that were more likely to have cardiac disease. Indeed, 0.4% of athletes in this group had more than 2,000 ventricular extrasystoles or at least one episode of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And 30% of athletes with these frequent rhythm disturbances had a cardiac problem. So what does abnormal ventricular ectopic morphology look like? And the message I want to get across to you is this message. If I only get one message across to you about abnormal ventricular extrasystoles, that should be this. The extrasystoles that conduct with wide right bundle branch block and a superior axis or a leftward axis require investigation. That's a very important message. Studies, emerging studies have shown that young athletes who have this type of extrasystole that demonstrate more than 500 of these over a 24 hour period or demonstrate that these extrasystoles increase with exercise, if you've got athletes showing that, then there's a very high chance, almost a 20% chance, that those athletes will have underlying myocardial scar or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. That's a very important and relatively novel message now. Here's an example of one such athlete with these extrasystoles who's now beginning to exercise, and you will see that that's the single extrasystole is now a couplet, with increasing exercise, we're beginning to see non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And of course, even I didn't have the nerve to let this athlete carry on and terminated the test. And we found extensive scar affecting the, the infralateral wall in this athletic individual. Apart from ventricular exercise, 
uh, with wide right bundle branch block, uh, other ventricular extrasystoles that are not good, any extrasystole that conducts with, with either wide right or left bundle branch block that has a superior axis should be viewed with caution. Obviously, couplets or triplets or polymorphic ventricular extrasystoles, as you're seeing here, different types of ventricular extrasystoles in any one athlete requires further investigation. So how do we assess athletes with ventricular ectopic beats? Clearly, assessment goes on symptoms. Symptoms is so important. When an athlete complains of symptoms, that individual clearly requires very thorough assessment. The family history is very important because many of the conditions that cause ventricular extrasystoles may be genetic and may be very serious. The resting ECG plays an important role because you may see clues about a serious problem such as ST segment depression, T wave inversion, a prolonged QT interval, or even an epsilon wave. The ectopic burden is important, as I've already showed you. The ectopic morphology is very important. The complexity of the morphology uh, of, of the ectopics is very important, and their relationship to exercise. Most benign ectopics, such as right ventricular output ectopic or fascicular ectopics, resolve with increasing heart rates, whereas pathological ectopics can actually be exacerbated by exercise. So red flags are people with cardiac symptoms or family history of premature cardiac disease, those with ectopics that conduct with wide right bundle branch block morphology, left bundle branch block morphology with superior or intermediate axis, or those with complex arrhythmias, either multifocal, couplets or triplets, or ventricular premature beats with short coupling intervals. Look for abnormalities on the ECG, as I've just pointed out. These people should have echocardiograms at the minimum. And if, you've, if they've got clearly an, an, an MRI, preferably, if they've got evidence of abnormal cardiac structure or function, then they, these are high risk individuals. And as I've already said to you, that ex, ectopics that increase or don't suppress with exercise should also be considered as high risk. And here's an example of an athlete who's got an ectopic. And this ectopic does conduct with, right, with left bundle branch morphology, suggesting it's coming from the right ventricle. But you see something else there. You see T-wave inversion in leads V2 and V3 and in the inferior leads, suggesting that this athlete may well have an underlying cardiac problem that requires further investigation. So how do we manage, manage people with benign looking ventricular extrasystoles? Well, if they're asymptomatic, no treatment, if the ventricular ectopic burden makes up 20% of their entire heart rate, then one may consider ablation because there is certainly some evidence that a very high burden of ectopics may cause, um, the, 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 the dyssynchrony associated with this may cause LV dysfunction. If someone's symptomatic, reassurance helps. We can treat them with verapamil or beta blockers, ask them to reduce their caffeine or alcohol intake, or even maybe reduce training. I only consider ablation in athletes who are symptomatic who have a relatively high burden of ventricular extrasystoles. You certainly wouldn't subject an athlete to ablation if they're only getting three or 400 extrasystoles in a 24 hour period. So in conclusion, although moderate exercise is associated with reduced risk of atrial fibrillation, lifelong exercise is associated with a five-fold increased risk of AF. Potential mechanisms of AF include atrial stretch, inflammation, fibrosis, and increased vagal turn. Exercise appears to protect from the adverse effects of AF. Ventricular premature beats arising from the outflow tract or the fascicle are usually benign. Ventricular premature beats require investigation if they're frequent, complex, increase in prevalence with exercise, and are accompanied by an abnormal ECG. Clearly, symptoms is also important. Symptomatic athletes and athletes with a family history of serious cardiac disease should be investigated. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Professor Rachel Lampert, who has a background in electrophysiology at Yale. Rachel's research has focused on patients with devices and optimizing the care of the athlete with a device. In fact, her research has changed the way we prescribe exercise in our patients with devices as well. So Rachel will be speaking on athletes with implantable cardiac devices. Rachel, over to you. Hello, I'm Rachel Lampert from uh, Yale University School of Medicine. I'm going to be speaking to you about athletes with implantable cardiac devices. Disclosures. So for many years, athletes with conditions that result in cardiac arrest 
who are treated with an ICD cannot participate in any moderate or high intensity competitive sports. And that was the way it was. That's what the 36th Bethesda Conference uh, eligibility recommendation said. And that's how the world felt. They did have a caveat, athletes with ICDs who have had no arrhythmias may engage in class 1A competitive sports. So what are 1A sports? Billiards, bowling, cricket, curling, golf, riflery, um, activities that you may not have even thought of, uh, about as sports. Uh, our elected leaders enjoy these sports, although many of our patients actually enjoy uh, other more vigorous sports as well. So the reason behind those recommendations were postulated risks. Would there be an increased likelihood of ventricular arrhythmias? Maybe the ICD would not be able to terminate arrhythmias during sports, during uh, changes in metabolic state, catecholamines, et cetera. Would there be a risk of injury due to syncopal arrhythmia or the shock itself, or could the system be damaged? Um, there are downsides, however, to athletic restriction. We all know that, uh, that, that uh, active kids do better in life. They are less likely to be obese. They do better in school, less risky behaviors, they, and they grow up to have more active kids themselves. And we all, uh, we all value the types of uh, qualities that organized sports build in our children. So this was a more specific uh, study about the downsides of athletic restriction. This was a study that looked at uh, quality of life in uh, athletes who were active and playing, athletes who had been sidelined, not necessarily due to cardiac events, but just due to orthopedic issues or whatever, and uh, non-athlete students. And they found that not only, was physical, uh, not only was physical quality of life higher in the athletes, but emotional life was as emotional quality of life was also. Um, but the sidelined athletes did worse in all uh, arenas compared to not just the active athletes, but the sedentary students as well. This was a study uh, that was a qualitative interview study of adolescents who had received ICDs. The purpose wasn't to look at sports, the purpose was to look at quality of life. But uh, basically they found that uh, the sports restriction was the most difficult part of receiving an, an ICD for so many of these adolescents. And this is a uh, quote from Matilda, age 15. I couldn't do sport, it really affected me. I was really into sport. Every kid runs around, I was bawling my eyes out. I hated the doctor. And uh, Matilda's mom, Maria, says, you see her cry and say, my life is over. And I just wanted her to play sports because it was something she enjoyed. So there's other uh, downsides to uh, restriction as well. While we think that restricting kids from sports, they're going to all join the chess club, that's probably not actually what's going to happen. This is a, uh, this is a great study from uh, the New Zealand team that described a series of kids who ended up being diagnosed with arrhythmogenic uh, uh, problems because they had arrhythmias while playing Fortnite. So in order to really start to sort this through, we started with a, um, we started with a questionnaire of a survey of Heart Rhythm Society members, just asking them, um, do you have any athletes with defibrillators who are currently participating in sports? Are they doing vigorous sports, contact sports, competitive sports? And we found that lots of physicians did report patients in their practices doing sports. And uh, just in this survey, there were not uh, any significant adverse events uh, noted. Now, there are many uh, biases associated with surveys, um, and this was no different, but what it did tell us was that, uh, at, that in individuals with defibrillators were out there doing sports, and at least from this survey, that uh, adverse events were not happening. And this allowed us to then uh, create a prospective registry called the ICD uh, Sports Safety Registry to identify athletes who had made the decision to participate in sports. Um, in an ethical fashion, we were not suggesting that people do things they were not already doing and that we would then follow them uh, over time. So uh, this was the goal, determine the safety of sports. The hypothesis was that the incidence of serious adverse events during sports, which was defined as tachyarrhythmic death or significant injury would be less than 1% over two years. And we had a variety of exploratory aims as well. So our patient population included 440 in the final group um, who were followed up for about four years. About a quarter were pediatric, about two thirds were male, most were white. Um, they all had good ejection fractions, not surprisingly, as these were all athletes. Um, many were taking beta blockers. This was not a low risk group. About half of them were for secondary prevention, meaning they had already had a cardiac arrest or unstable arrhythmia. Uh, cardiac diagnoses included long QT, most commonly HCM. There were a number of ARVC patients in this study, and we'll be talking more about that later. We did not, uh, we did not have inclusion and exclusion criteria around diagnosis. If you were, had an ICD and were doing sports, uh, you could participate. 
Um, they were doing sports uh, common in the United States. They were running, uh, cycling, playing baseball and basketball. Um, in the highly competitive group, which we defined as individuals uh, doing interscholastic varsity type sports, and this, um, this is not correct, the highest was uh, soccer, basketball, and baseball. So the younger patients, we reported separately 129 athletes uh, who had uh, ICDs before 21, and we had 20 very high level collegiate athletes and 79 very high level high school athletes who were doing varsity and JV type sports. So we followed them for uh, close to four years. There were 37 who didn't complete the study. Some were lost to follow up. Um, a few got worse with whatever their condition was. Two died. Um, one was a 52 year old cyclist with coronary disease who died at work after receiving shocks, probably an arrhythmic death, although not sports related. And one was a younger woman who had a cardiomyopathy that worsened over the course of the study. Uh, so primary endpoints, we saw no tack rhythmic deaths, no externally uh, resuscitated arrests. We had no significant injuries. So what do you do with no, uh, number of zero? Basically, that doesn't mean the risk is zero. Um, the number was 440. You put a 95% confidence interval around it based on the number. So we were able to say that the risk at two years was uh, the 95% uh, was less than 0.9% with 95% confidence. And at four years, due to the smaller number followed for that long was 2.2%. So these patients did receive shocks. They received ventricular rhythm. Uh, they received shocks for ventricular arrhythmias, for supraventricular arrhythmias, for noise, and they received shocks during competition. They received shocks during other physical activity, and they received shocks at rest. Uh, we found that um, while uh, the numbers uh, of patients receiving shocks during competition or physical act activity was higher than the number receiving shocks at rest. There was no difference between the number who received shocks uh, during competition compared to other physical activity. And that was for ventricular arrhythmias as well as total. So uh, did ICD shocks affect sports participation? So 51 of the total had received ICD shocks during sports. Uh, some did stop, some stopped one, but not, other, not others, but almost all ended up going back. And some patients had also received, uh, stopped sports due to shocks received at other times. So there were some, uh, there were some uh, patients who received, or athletes rather, who received shocks, uh, who, who required multiple shocks for termination. This wasn't common, but we did see a few, and these uh, mostly occurred in patients with either ARVC, uh, coronary disease, uh, or CPVT. Um, the only patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who received multiple shocks at any time was when, uh, was actually when they were at home uh, uh, socializing with friends. So what uh, characteristics were associated with appropriate shocks during sports? Um, in this group was actually the, an older age, not the younger patients. That may have been a uh, selection bias, and uh, ARVC and idiopathic VF. And I suspect those were actually CPVT that uh, perhaps had been missed. So what about what, what are the limitations of this study? Paid participants were self-selected, may not represent all athletes with ICDs. We didn't have a control group. Follow-up was limited. But in summary, we are able to say that shocks were not rare during sports, that there were no injuries or failures to defibrillate, and that patients returned to sports despite shocks. So we were pleased when uh, these data resulted in a change in the current guidelines, uh, which, had, which came out in 2015. At, uh, moving away from the complete restriction for patients with ICDs, as I had shown initially, with the updated uh, recommendations, participation in sports with higher uh, static and dynamic components in class 1A may be considered, in other words, a class 2B uh, recommendation. And uh, they uh, say the decision should be made with consideration and counseling regarding possible uh, shocks. So does this mean that all athletes with all ICD should be participating in all sports every minute of the day? Probably not. So when we looked at all sports, um, when we talk about all sports, we had patients uh, who are, are athletes who are playing basketball and who are playing soccer, which are considered uh, contact sports by the American Academy of Pediatrics. But we did not have patients doing uh, really aggressive contact sports. We had one or two football players. Um, and we, uh, we did not have one or two hockey players, one martial arts. We did not have a lot of the aggressive contact sports and whether uh, uh, system damage could be higher in these sports uh, is certainly possible. What about all diagnoses? So we did see multiple shocks in patients with CPVT and idiopathic VF that may have been CPVT. Um, and I think that's certainly a group that we need to be very careful about. 
Um, we also did not look at the progression of the underlying disease. And this is something that uh, has been addressed um, by other investigators. Um, this, uh, the group at Hopkins has looked extensively at patients with ARVC and found that um, high levels of endurance exercise, particularly, may uh, increase heart failure as well as arrhythmias in that population. Um, so in order to uh, determine whether uh, sports participation actually increases risk of arrhythmic events and also whether what's the, what are the uh, safety issues for patients who don't yet have defibrillators, we have an ongoing study, uh, Exercise in Genetic Cardiovascular Disease, Live HCM and Live uh, Long QT. We've enrolled close to 2,000 patients in each group. Um, we're actually uh, finishing the, we finished the, uh, the follow-up period and uh, um, expecting results at the end of this year. So at this point, I think we're ready to move from the if uh, patients with ICD should be uh, participating in sports. Um, if you look at, uh, see on the left, this was a debate in the literature from 2008, and this was just one of many, to the question of how, and this was a talk I gave last year at HRS, how can we support sports in the pediatric population with ICDs? So, of course, uh, programming is very important as we're starting to support these athletes going back to play. Um, we did a sub-analysis of the uh, ICD sports study where we looked at programming and not surprisingly found that longer uh, durations and higher rate cutoffs resulted in fewer appropriate and inappropriate shocks without an increase in syncope or other complications. Um, so uh, certainly that um, is one important aspect of this. Um, what about lead survival? Basically, um, we do not have a control population, but in comparison with historical controls, lead survival was not different um, in these athletes. And some, uh, we did find, we looked uh, in another sub-analysis at factors influencing lead survival. Um, we did not see an increase in lead malfunction in patients doing uh, like heavy arm sports, like swimming and rowing, although it's possible we didn't have enough uh, swimmers and rowers to really tell. Um, we did find that those at the very highest level of weight lifting may have had an increase in, uh, lead, uh, in lead malfunctions. So what about all defibrillators? Um, the ICD sports uh, registry enrolled only patients with transvenous devices due to the timing of the registry. Um, there are theoretic advantages of the subcutaneous device. There's no friction between the clavicle and the first rib. There's theoretic disadvantages. Um, the lead is outside the thorax. Um, in order to answer this question, um, there is an, uh, a study about to start led by uh, Sammy Viskin in Israel to look at the safety of sports for patients with sub-Q ICDs. So who decides? Uh, how, how do we decide who's going back now that we're able to consider it? Um, Shared decision-making is a concept that is increasingly entering all, uh, all aspects of medical care. And this was really first used as a phrase in 2012 when Johnson and Ackerman reported the uh, approach to athletes with uh, congenital, uh, congenital, mostly heart uh, inherited uh, arrhythmia syndromes um, who had chosen to go back to play. Um, in that study, uh, in that report rather, they described the approach at the Mayo Clinic to uh, discussing return to play with athletes uh, with uh, cardiac disease. And in that uh, study, 157 chose to go back, uh, I'm sorry, 130 chose to go back out of 157. So it was a real conversation. Not everyone did uh, choose, to, choose to go back to play. One thing I will just mention as well, though, that um, shared decision-making is a very trendy phrase, and we use it a lot, but the concept uh, is, not, is not new. This uh, on the bottom is a study that was written by Ben Levine in, in the 1980s about uh, the role of the physician and individual assumption of risk. And I will say as well that all of the competitive athletes in our study um, were doing things at a uh, time when the gu guidelines said no, and uh, presumably there was some shared uh, decision-making going on. So what is shared decision-making? How do we talk to the athlete and the family about returning to play? So I start by discussing the data. What are the limits of the data? Is the patient in front of you typical of the athletes in whom the data was collected? If yes or if no, how not, why not? What do the experts say? Why do they say what they do? So I also emphasize to patients and families that thinking about risk is hard and irrational. This person actually won a Nobel Prize in economics for pointing this out, but I think as doctors, we, we all know this. Um, an example uh, was the increase in driving deaths that occurred after 
I also talk to patients and families about the spectrum of comfort uh, with risk. So I talk a lot about this girl at the top who uh, sailed around the world by herself at age 16. Now, this was obviously a, a family with a high tolerance uh, for risk. I personally would not have done this. Um, on the other hand, we also have uh, American football. Um, we get no increasing risks about football and, and many uh, patients and many uh, families do feel comfortable with their, uh, with their children going forward to play football. And I often will say to, uh, to uh, the athlete and the family, I can't tell you where, uh, your, where on the spectrum of risk you fall between sailing around the world by yourself, playing American football, but I think it does give patients and families a way of thinking about their own comfort uh, with thinking about risk and gives them a, a paradigm to, to uh, use as they're making that decision. I'd like to end by thanking um, the sites and uh, principal investigators who participated in the uh, ICD Sports-Based Safety Registry, both in North America and in Europe and outside of the US, as well as all the sites participating in our ongoing uh, study of the safety of exercise for HCM and long QT. Thank you very much. So as a chair, it's very odd to introduce myself as the next speaker. Um, I run an NHS sports cardiology service at the Brompton. My other interests include inherited cardiac conditions and cardiac MRI, and I also work with the IACH in the management of athletes. So I'll be speaking on athletes with valvular heart disease. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Sabia Gatti, and it's a pleasure to give this talk on athletes with valvular heart disease. I have no disclosures. So the objectives of this session will be to discuss the effects of exercise on valvular heart disease. I will give you a pragmatic framework for the assessment and restratification of individuals prior to competitive sports. We will go through a general outline for the management of individuals with valve disease. We will then discuss the guidelines and the EAPC recommendations for tri-leaflet aortic valve disease and bicuspid aortic valves. We will then switch over to the mitral valve pathology and mitral valve prolapse. And I will finally finish on athletes with prosthetic valve disease. So valvular heart disease is common in the general population and it is an age-related degenerative process affecting individuals in their fifth decade onwards. But there is also this pertinent group of young individuals with congenital valvular abnormalities affecting around three to 4% of this population who may be asymptomatic and aspire to participate in competitive sports. Now, most of the impetus in sports cardiology has been to focus on safe exercise in young individuals, but actually the vast majority of our recreational athletes are middle-aged and older and constitute approximately 40% of participants in mass endurance events. So my first key message is that this is a disease process affecting both young and mature athletes. The effects of exercise on valvular heart disease is unknown, but it is theoretically possible that an increasing cardiac preload, stroke volume, and a cardiac afterload may cause acceleration of valvular dysfunction, cause compensatory left ventricular hypertrophy, myocardial ischemia, pulmonary hypertension, and myocardial arrhythmias. Now, sports cardi cardiology is a relatively novel subspeciality, and there is a lack of longitudinal data in our athletes with valvular heart disease. Therefore, most of the information that's derived is based on the natural history of valve disease in the general population. When we consider uh, factors that determine exercise prescription in individuals with valvular heart disease, in addition to the severity of the valve lesion, you need to take into consideration their symptomatic status, functional capacity, left ventricular function, pulmonary artery pressures, exercise-induced arrhythmias and ischemia, and blood pressure response to exercise. In general, my key message too is on the, uh, on the exercise recommendations in athletes with valvular heart disease. So asymptomatic individuals with mild valvular regurgitation or mild valvular disease may engage in all sports. Those with severe valve abnormalities are considered to be high risk and the advice is not to engage in intensive exercise. Those with moderate regurgitant lesions, these are better tolerated than stenotic lesions. And the advice is if your individual is asymptomatic with good LV function or with no evidence of ischemia and a good hemodynamic response to exercise, they may engage in all sports. And those with bicuspid aortic valves and mitral valve prolapse will have other considerations which you'll need to take into account before prescribing exercise. <laughs> 
My key me message three relates to the assessment and restratification of individuals with valve disease. So this is a stepwise approach. The first step should be to assess their symptomatic status, examine them and do an ECG looking for strain patterns. Step two should be echocardiography plus other advanced imaging. And, uh, and with this, you want to assess the severity of the valve lesion, the etiology, the impact of loading conditions on cardiac structure and function. And this needs to be interpreted in the context of athletic remodeling itself. Step three should be your exercise stress testing or cardiopulmonary exercise testing if this is available. And you want to exercise the individual to the intensity that they want to train at, checking the symptoms, arrhythmias, ischemia, and their blood pressure heart rate response to exercise. Step four should be to make your recommendations on the type, intensity, and duration of exercise. And the final step should be that these individuals should rem remain under follow-up, be it too early for your mild valvular lesions uh, or six monthly for your moderate to severe valve lesions. So based on the Italian data, uh, we know that around 14% of athletes will have an LV cavity size of more than 60 millimeters. And this is often identified in your large adult males engaging in endurance exercise. But at the same time, it can be tricky to interpret cardiac size secondary to valvular regurgitation. Therefore, we have provided upper limits for ventricular dimensions in athletic individuals with moderate regurgitant lesions. So those, for those who have aortic regurgitation, we like to focus on end systolic dimensions, of less than 50 millimeters in males and less than 40 millimeters in females or less than 25 millimeters per meter squared in either sex. And for mitral regurgitation, we are focusing on end diastolic dimensions of less than 60 millimeters in either sex less than 40 millimeters per meter squared in females or less than 35 millimeters per meter squared in males. Now, these cutoffs are as a pragmatic approach and we appreciate that you will have some outliers. And so in those cases, you should uh, make a case by case decision and you may need to rely on excise echo for their contractile reserve, CMR for accurate volume assessment and even their peak oxygen consumption. So let's talk, put all of this into context. So here we have a 19 year old male athlete who uh, was evaluated as part of a routine pre-participation screening assessment. He is participating in elite level competitive football. He's asymptomatic with no family history of concern and he's been followed up for the last three years. You will appreciate this, that his ECG demonstrates voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, but otherwise does not demonstrate any training unrelated ECG changes. He went on to have an echocardiogram on, and on echo, he had an LV end diastolic cavity size of 60 millimeters and his end systolic dimension was less than 50. His left ventricular systolic function was preserved. And you'll appreciate that he has a bicuspid aortic valve with moderate mitro, uh, aortic regurgitation, which is directed towards the anterior mitral valve leaflet. His aortic root dimensions were normal and there was no reported coarctation. He proceeded to an exercise stress test where he achieved 17 minutes of the Bruce protocol and completed 96% of his maximum predicted. He was symptom free with no evidence of ischemia or arrhythmias and he also demonstrated a normal blood pressure response to exercise. We proceeded to a cardiac MRI study, which reported a mildly dilated left ventricle with a, a good stroke volume. His ejection fraction was 62% and there was no left ventricular hypertrophy. You'll appreciate that he does have a bicuspid aortic valve with a fusion of his left and right coronary cusp with a regurgitant fraction of 32%, which was in the moderate category. His aorta was not not dilated from the aortic root to ascending aorta to arch and descending aorta, and there was no evidence of myocardial scar. So on the basis of this evaluation, the advice was that he should remain under a six monthly follow-up plan and that he may engage in competitive football provided he remains asymptomatic. So let's take a look at the recommendations for competitive sports participation in athletes with aortic regurgitation. So on the left, I have provided the ESC guidelines and on the right are the EAPC recommendations. So both the guidelines and recommendations advise that for those with mild aortic regurgitation, they may engage in all competitive sports. For your moderate aortic regurgitation, the ESC guideline advise participation in all competitive sports, provided your left ventricular ejection fraction is more than 50% and you have a normal exercise test. The EAPC recommendations are slightly more conservative in that they advise only moderate intensity competitive sports.
For your severe aortic regurgitation, and the advice is on low to moderate intensity exercise, provided your left ventricular ejection fraction is more than 50% and you have a normal exercise test. Let's have a look at the guidelines and recommendations for those with asymptomatic aortic stenosis. So for mild aortic stenosis, the advice is they may engage in all competitive sports. For moderate aortic stenosis, the advice is low to moderate effort competitive sports, provided your rejection fraction is more than 50%, you have a good functional capacity and a normal blood pressure response to exercise. And those with severe aortic stenosis, this is considered to be a high risk valve abnormality, and therefore the advice is to do low intensity skill sports only if your rejection fraction is more than 50%. Bicuspid aortic valve is a common congenital abnormality affecting 1-2% to of the general population. There are some com complications you need to be aware of, including progression to severe aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, aortic dilatation, which is identified in around 50% of bicuspid aortic patients, and the unrecognized co-optation identified in around 10%. And like mitral valve prolapse, there is a genetic component, although a specific gene mutation has yet to be identified. But we know that around 10 to 11% of family members all have more than one affected individual. So I'd like to share our experience of bicuspid aortic valve disease and aortopathy. We did this study to explore the progression of aortic root dilatation in young professional soccer players with bicuspid aortic valve disease. There were 20 professional soccer players with bicuspid aortic valve. They were compared with 24 non-athletes with bicuspid aortic valve and 22 healthy athletes with a normal tricuspid aortic valve. They were all male and their aortic roots were measured at the sinuses of valve salva, at their baseline echo and on a subsequent follow-up echo. So the results showed that there was no significant difference in the aortic root dimensions in any one of the three groups over a five-year follow-up period. So the take-home message from this study is that in the short term, the aortic root does not appear to be impacted by exercise intensity. However, as it stands, it remains unclear as to whether intensive exercise causes acceleration of the aortic root in the long term. So I'm talking 10 to 15 years from now. And therefore, the guidance uh, suggests a cautious approach to sports activity in individuals with an aortic root of more than 40 millimetres. In the absence of an aortopathy, the exercise recommendations for, for individuals with a bicuspid aortic valve are the same as those for a trileaflet aortic valve dysfunction. So let's switch over to mitral or valvular abnormality. So let's have a look at the recommendations in asymptomatic individuals with mitral regurgitation. So both the guidelines and recommendations advise that they may engage in all competitive sports. Those with moderate mitral regurgitation may participate in all competitive sports, provided their LV and diastolic dimension is less than 60 or less than 35 millimeters per meter squared in men and less than 40, 40 millimeters per meter squared in women. Their rejection fraction is more than 60%. Their systolic pulmonary artery pressure is less than 50 and they have a normal exercise test. Those with severe mitral regurgitation, the advice is to engage in low intensity exercise only, provided you fulfill the parameters we've just discussed. So rheumatic mitral valve disease is uncommon in the Western world, but with the increasing emigration patterns, cardiologists may encounter individuals with rheumatic mitral valve disease who may aspire to participate in competitive sports. Therefore, I think it's important knowing these recommendations. So the guidelines and recommendations suggest that those with mild mitral stenosis may engage in all competitive sports, provided their resting systolic pulmonary artery pressure is less than 40 millimeters of mercury and they have a normal exercise test. Those with moderate mitral stenosis, the advice is on low intensity exercise only if your systolic pulmonary artery pressure is less than 40 and you have a normal exercise test. And for severe mitral stenosis, it is recommended that they should not engage in competitive sports. Mitral valve prolapse is characterized by fibromyxomatous changes of the mitral valve leaflets. The prevalence is less than 3% in the general population. It's usually a benign condition with a 10 year mortality risk of around 5%. The main complication is progression to severe mitral regurgitation. And from the data in the literature, there appears to be an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death with mitral valve prolapse. And, and so the advice is in addition to an echo, these individual, individuals should have some form of halter assessment. So 
on based on this data on the cardiac pathology registry on 650 young adults, the authors identified that mitral valve prolapse accounted for 7% of all sudden cardiac deaths, and this was more common in women. And in addition, they identified certain risk parameters for sudden death. So if you have an athlete who has mitral valve prolapse with mild to moderate mitral regurgitation, they may engage in all sports, including competitive sports, in the absence of the following risk markers. So the presence of T-wave inversion on your inferior leads, long QT, documented arrhythmias, family history of sudden cardiac death, bileaflet mitral valve prolapse or mitral annular disjunction, basal infralateral fibrosis on a cardiac MRI study, severe mitral regurgitation and severe LV dysfunction. In the presence of any one of these risk markers, the advice is not to engage in intensive exercise. You may encounter individuals who require a prosthetic valve replacement or who may have undergone a prosthetic valve replacement. And these individuals should be evaluated in a similar fashion to those with native valvular disease, so with an echo and an excise test. Prosthetic valve hemodynamics appear to be suboptimal compared to your native valves. Therefore, I, th I think it's important to do a stress uh, exercise echo in these individuals to assess the intensity of exercise they want to actually engage in, check for symptoms and the hemodynamics across the valve itself. In addition, we you will need to consider anticoagulation, and if they do, if they are anticoagulated, they should avoid contact collision sports. You will need to give them advice on the risk of infective endocarditis and good dental hygiene. And th these individuals should avoid tattoos and body piercings. So my final key message is that a mechanical prosthesis affects mechanics of the ventricular function. It's associated with a pressure gradient. And therefore, the exercise recommendations for individuals with prosthetic valves are the same as those with for your moderate native valve disease. So in conclusion, or my final key messages are that in individuals with mild valvular regurgitation, there is no restriction to sports. Moderate regurgitation lesions are compatible with exercise in the presence of a good functional capacity, the absence of symptoms and hemodynamic disturbances during exercise testing. Individuals with severe valve disease should not engage in intensive exercise. The presence of an aortopathy also influences decisions in patients with bicuspid aortic valve. And the presence of risk markers associated with mitral valve prolapse will influence your exercise intensity. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nabil Sheikh, who is a consultant cardiologist at St. Thomas's Hospital and also, and also works with me at the IACH. His interests also include uh, inherited cardiac conditions, imaging and sports cardiology. Nabil's research has been, has been to focus on the evaluation of athletes. He will be speaking on athletes with myocarditis, a very hot topic at the moment. Nabil, the platform is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Nabil Sheikh. I'm a consultant cardiologist and honorary C clinical lecturer in inherited cardiac conditions, sports cardiology and imaging. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to give this talk today, which is going to be on athletes with myocarditis. So before I begin the talk, I'd like to set out some aims and objectives. And during the talk, I'm going to concentrate on things that I think that you guys will need to know as professionals who look after athletes and therefore may have to deal with an athlete who has myocarditis. So we'll start by defining what myocarditis is and what causes it. We'll go on to look at why this is an important diagnosis to make in an athlete and the symptoms they may have. Um, we'll go on to look at the diagnosis of myocarditis and how we make this particularly using MRI. We'll look at the risk factor, factors and sequelae of myocarditis and also touch upon management and return to play um, of athletes who have myocarditis. So to begin with, um, we can define myocarditis as a non-ischemic heart muscle disorder, which is characterized by acute inflammation of the uh, myocardium, which leads to myocyte degeneration and necrosis, um, which in turn can lead to scarring, arrhythmias, cardiac dysfunction and sudden cardiac death. In terms of the prevalence, we know it's the commonest cause of arrhythmias, myocardial dysfunction, heart failure and sudden death in young, otherwise healthy individuals. From this study, 
you can see that the vast majority of cases are clustered towards the younger age spectrum. And when it comes to myocarditis in athletes, the exact incidence and prevalence is not known. If we take a look at autopsy findings in people who've died suddenly in the general population, it appears that myocarditis accounts for up to 10%. And if we look at um, similar studies, but in athletes, we find that myocarditis is implicated in the sudden cardiac death of between two to 25% of individuals. And finally, we also know from studies in military recruits that myocarditis is the cause of sudden cardiac death in up to 20% of individuals, depending on the study that you look at. In terms of the etiology, this can be divided up into infective and non-infective causes. And by far the commonest of the infective causes are viruses, particularly upper airway and GI tract viruses, including COVID-19. But it has to, it's important to bear in mind um, bacterial, fungal and parasitic uh, causes as well, particularly in athletes who originate from countries where such infections are endemic. And then the non-infective causes include things like inflammatory diseases, such as systemic lupus erythematosus, um, medications and drugs, and other damaging um, agents, including things like cocaine, lithium, lead, and arsenic. Now, some people suggest that athletes, because of their unique lifestyle, may be more susceptible to myocarditis. For example, they may be exposed to certain um, drugs and medications, not only to improve symptoms, um, but they may also um, be susceptible to um, recreational drugs such as cocaine and doping substances such as amphetamines, dissociation curve modulators, anabolic agents, um, and other substances that can potentially induce myocardial inflammation or cardiomyopathy. In addition, we know that athletes, of course, have a, a particularly unique lifestyle, which is characterized by frequent international travel, leading to increased exposure to a wide variety of pathogens and accompanied by factors that may potentially impair the athlete's immune system. For example, extreme climate um, environments or high altitudes during competition. And in addition, we know that the immunological competence may also be impaired by sleep deprivation, jet lag, climate shifts, and exhaustive um, exertion during long um, tournaments and full timetables. And particularly if an athlete continues to train or is involved in competition despite symptoms of a viral infection, this may be an additional factor which, when combined with the other factors, may mean that the athlete is more susceptible to pathogens trans trespassing the physical barriers, spreading systemically and ultimately affecting um, the um, myocardium, causing um, arrhythmias and other symptoms. In talking of symptoms, um, athletes may exhibit a number of these, just like anyone in the general population, including breathlessness due to signs of the infection itself or heart failure. Um, chest pain or pressure is an important symptom not to ignore, particularly in an athlete who has a viral infection. Um, the athlete may have uh, signs and symptoms of infection itself, such as uh, high temperature or other constitutional symptoms. And things like lightheadedness, fatigue, and, a and um, palpitation may also occur. And finally, if an athlete has heart failure, they may develop signs and symptoms of heart failure, such as swollen ankles. But it's important to remember that some athletes, particularly in the early phase of myocarditis, may not have any symptoms at all. And this is important to realize because we know that exercising during an infection or during the early phases of myocarditis can lead to um, an in increased um, risk of myocarditis and worsening of the condition. And this data is based predominantly on mice model of myocarditis, where mice have been infected with cytomegaly B um, virus, um, where a myocarditis has been induced and they've been made to in, uh, exercise intensely, in this case, um, they've been made to swim. And we see from these studies that um, these mice exhibit an increased viral teeter, an increased number of cytotoxic T cells, um, which in turn can lead to an intense inflammatory response as well as 
a protracted inflammatory period, which in turn may lead to extensive myocardial fibrosis and an unstable myocardial substrate uh, leading to sudden death. And most of these studies have shown a significantly increased mortality, um, particularly um, when the mice um, exercise strenuously during the early phase. Now, the diagnosis of myocarditis can be made using various different tests. Blood tests, for example, may be useful. For example, erased uh, inflammatory markers, CRP and white count, but also erased troponin signifying myocardial uh, necrosis and inflammation. But remember that an ath athlete may also have erased troponin due to um, exercise and therefore uh, troponin levels are usually measured 48 hours after complete rest. A chest x-ray may be useful in looking for infection and signs of heart failure and an ECG may show repolarization changes but again um, we have to remember that um, the changes that we see um, may also be part of the spectrum of normal athlete's heart. And the same applies for echocardiography where we may see a pericardial effusion but also um, LV dysfunction and dilatation um, but again these need to be differentiated from what we normally see in an athlete for example endurance athletes will have LV dilatation with resting uh, low normal LV function. Now cardiac MRI scanning uh, is the gold standard non-invasive test for diagnosing uh, myocarditis and it's really revolutionized our um, uh, diagnosis and risk stratification um, for this condition and I'm going to talk about it in the next few slides. And finally, in those presenting acutely with cardiogenic shock or unexplained cardiomyopathy with arrhythmias or a very fulminant aggressive cardiomyopathy, a heart muscle biopsy is usually mandated to find out what's going on. Now I've mentioned the role of cardiac MRI in diagnosis and the unique feature of MRI scanning is its ability to look at the myocardial tissue directly. And this has led to the development of the revised Lake Louise criteria for myocarditis. Now this diagnose, diagnostic criteria comprise two separate categories, namely the presence of myocardial edema and the presence of non-ischemic myocardial injury on uh, cardiac MRI scanning. In terms of myocardial edema, there needs to be one of two criterion present, uh, namely high T2 signal intensity on STIR imaging or high T2 values on T2 mapping. And in terms of the non-ischemic myocardial injury, again, one of two criteria are required, namely the presence of non-ischemic late gadolinium enhancement and either um, high T1 values or increased extracellular volume. And in addition, on MRI, supportive criteria favoring a diagnosis of myocarditis include regional or global hyperkinesia and uh, pericardial enhancement or pericardial effusion. And MRI scanning has also been very shown to be very useful in risk stratifying um, patients with myocarditis. And this study by Grani et al has shown that SCAR on MRI scan appears to be a powerful predictor both of adverse cardiac events as well as um, annualized event rates for death, doubling both of these things. And in addition, we know that if scarring is combined with poor LV function, then the outcomes are particularly bad. So which athletes should get an MRI scan? Um, so in my opinion, these, in, these include athletes with symptoms of cardiac involvement, such as chest pain, breathlessness, or palpitation, um, athletes with impaired LV function or pericardial effusion, those with new or unexplained ECG changes, and those who have a raised troponin after uh, 48 hours after complete rest. Now, this list isn't exhaustive, but it's uh, some of the things that I think should uh, trigger a, a cardiac MRI scan. Now, the natural history of myocarditis can be quite varied, but also always starts with a toxic stimulus to the heart. Now, in some individuals, complete healing may occur without the presence of scar, and therefore the MRI scan is normal and their risk of arrhythmias and heart failure is extremely low. Now, healing may also occur with the presence of scar, which is detected on MRI scanning. And in these individuals, although their LV function is preserved, so they don't have heart failure, they may be susceptible to ventricular arrhythmias. And this outcome is seen in up to 50% of cases 
uh, combined, so healing with or without scar. Now, on the other hand, some individuals may progress to develop an acute cardiomyopathy with replacement fibrosis and inflammation, which uh, can be seen on an MRI scan. And these individuals may exhibit um, heart failure symptoms because of LV dysfunction as well as ventricular arrhythmias. And this outcome is seen in up to 12 to 25 percent of cases. And finally, the uh, acute cardiomyopathy may evolve into a long term dilated cardiomyopathy where you see LV dilatation, LV systolic dysfunction, wall thinning and uh, a significant um, uh, amount of scarring. And this uh, is seen in 25 percent of cases. And these individuals are at the highest risk of arrhythmias and heart failure. And it's important to remember that um, the acute phase can lead to a long term phase, but also um, in individuals who start off with healing, a relapse can occur, particularly if these individuals continue to exercise. Now, I've spoken about various modalities for diagnosing myocarditis, but exercise testing and halter monitoring can also be useful. And in particular, a high burden of ventricular topics, namely over 500 in 24 hours, can be a marker of previous subclinical myocarditis. And we know from various studies that if these ventricular topics increase in frequency with exercise, then they are associated with scarring on the MRI. Um, and indeed, the highest probability of MRI scarring and other abnormalities occurs in those not only with a high burden of ventricular ectopics, but also with repolarization changes on their baseline ECG and those with complex ectopics with, for example, a broad right bundle branch block pattern. So summarising what we've seen so far, risk markers in athletes with myocarditis includes impaired LV function, a high burden of ventricular ectopics, particularly those which increase with exercise, new ECG repolarization changes, myocardial scar and ongoing inflammation on a cardiac MRI scan and an ongoing raised troponin. Now, in terms of management of athletes with myocarditis, this is along standard lines and based predominantly on their risk. So high risk individuals with uh, acute a cardiogenic shock, um, severe LV impairment and ventricular arrhythmias should be seen in a specialist centre. Um, they may need mechanical support and most will need a uh, biopsy. And um, we may also need to treat them with uh, steroids or other immunosuppressants. And of course, all these individuals should have a cardiac MRI scan. Moving on to those of intermediate risk, these individuals may or may not have heart failure symptoms, they'll have a degree of LV impairment, but generally no ventricular arrhythmias. And we should consider treating these individuals in a specialist centre, although a uh, mechanical support is rarely needed um, and a biopsy may be considered. Um, again, these individuals should all have a cardiac MRI scan and we may treat some of these individuals with immunosuppression. And finally, we have the low risk category in whom heart failure symptoms are absent, their LV function is normal or only mildly depressed, and they have no ventricular arrhythmias. And these individuals can be uh, in, um, managed at their local district general hospital. They won't need mechanical support or a biopsy and won't need any treatment with steroids or immunosuppressants. But again, they should have a cardiac MRI scan. So this is a management algorithm for athletes with myocarditis, um, and I'm going to focus on those individuals with an abnormal MRI scan and what to do in those. So if an athlete has an abnormal MRI scan, but this just shows pericarditis, um, then the athlete can be restricted from playing sport for three months. Uh, and if the inflammation and everything returns back to normal, then they can go back to playing. If, on the other hand, the MRI scan shows evidence of myocarditis, then the athlete should be restricted from competing for at least three to six months, after which they should have a repeat MRI scan. And if this shows ongoing um, changes or if there's other uh, ongoing arrhythmias, then again, further restriction is needed, followed by a repeat MRI scan again. If the MRI scan um, ends up showing no inflammation, the athlete is asymptomatic uh, 
they have a normal exercise test and a normal MRI scan, then they can go back to um, um, uh, participating, but may require follow up. And in those athletes who um, recover, but um, do have um, some scarring, which goes down in, 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 in magnitude, they've got no arrhythmia, no inflammation. Um, we need to make uh, decisions on a case to case um, basis, um, but generally um, they can uh, go back to exercising, although we may need to monitor some of these individuals more closely. In terms of special considerations for athletes with myocarditis, um, the key message is resting the heart in the early stages for at least three months. It's important to remember that some athletes may need to be excluded from intense exercise long term if they have LV dysfunction. And those who have scarring of the heart may need long term surveillance like once once a year. Now, moving on to return to play um, in athletes with myocarditis, these slides are taken directly from the ESC 2020 guidelines on sports participation for athletes with cardiac conditions. So I'm not going to read them out word for word, namely to say that the first recommendation is that comprehensive evaluation using a wide modality of tests is recommended in athletes. And also return to all forms of exercise should only be considered after three to six months in athletes who fulfill various criteria stated here, namely normal LV function, no arrhythmias and uh, absence of uh, myocardial um, scarring and fibrosis. In those individuals who have a definite diagnosis of myocarditis, exercise is not recommended while there is active inflammation. After the inflammation has settled, uh, participation in moderate and high intensity exercise is not recommended for at least three to six months. And finally, in those with myocarditis who've recovered but who have been left with myocardial scar and LV dysfunction, um, participation in leisure exercise or competitive sports involving high intensity is not recommended, but we take this on a case by case basis. In terms of long term surveillance of those athletes with myocarditis and cardiac scar, we tend to perform six monthly assessments in the first year. They should have very wearable ECG monitors during training and shortly after return to play. And they should all undergo a repeat MRI scan in the first six months. We should also educate the athlete about symptoms to look out for, particularly palpitation, um, um, presyncope and syncope. So in summary, um, myocarditis is an important diagnosis to make in an athlete, given the risks of exercising with the condition. Diagnosis and risk stratification has been revolutionized by the use of cardiac MRI scanning. Risk factors for worse outcomes include LV dysfunction, scar, a high burden of ventricular ectopics, particularly if those increase with exercise, and resting the heart is a very important part of the management. In addition, long-term surveillance may be needed in some athletes, who particularly those with SCAR. So I'll stop there. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions in the question and answer sessions. Thank you very much for your attention. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Flavio Desenzi, who's an Associate Professor in Sports Cardiology at the University of Siena. Flavio's research has been dedicated to the field of sports cardiology. In fact, he's been a machine in his publication rates. He's our chair-elect for European Nucleus for Sports Cardiology and Exercise of EAPC. Flavio will be talking about athletes with coronary anomalies and coronary artery disease. Flavio, the platform is yours. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. First of all, I wish to thank the organizer for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to talk about athletes with uh, coronary artery disease. In the next few minutes, we will talk about athletes with abnormal coronary arteries, which means that we will talk about not only ischemic heart disease, but also uh, an the anomalous origin and course of the coronary arteries, particularly in young competitive athletes. Indeed, we know very well that unfortunately, coronary artery uh, anomaly is one of the main causes of sudden death 
in the population of competitive athletes and particularly in the population uh, of pre-adolescent and uh, adolescent uh, athletes practice, practicing sports. And uh, unfortunately, irrespective of the differences in terms of pre-participation screening, the prevalence of coronary artery anomaly as a cause of sudden cardiac death is relatively high, for instance, in US as well as uh, in Italy, in which you know very well that the pre-participation screening of competitive athletes is mandatory by, uh, by law. This is the latest publications about the um, sudden cardiac death in young athletes and non-athletes by our uh, research group, demonstrating that the anomalous origin of coronary arteries is a frequent cause of sudden death in athletes and is more frequent in athletes as compared to the uh, population of young sedentary uh, individuals. And more than uh, almost 20 years ago, Professor Corrado demonstrated that the relative risk of diet suddenly uh, if uh, an athlete has a coronary uh, artery anomaly is uh, relatively high, in particular is higher as compared to the population of sedentary uh, individuals. And uh, the pre-participation evaluation, primarily based on physical uh, uh, examination, personal and family history, and resting ECG clearly demonstrated a dramatic decrease in the incidence of sudden cardiac death in the population of screened competitive athletes. athletes. However, uh, resting ECG is not enough for the detection of coronary artery uh, anomalies. Indeed, we now use the radio and we listen the radio and we like the radio. But now we have also the opportunity not only to listen, but also to see something. And so we have the opportunity to use ECHO to detect the uh, anomalies uh, in the population of competitive athletes. And uh, two years ago, we conducted a survey uh, uh, with, among the uh, European colleagues that were involved in the pre-participation evaluation of competitive athletes in order to, uh, to know whether irrespective of the current guidelines and recommendations, they uh, use ECHO to complete the cardiovascular evaluation of competitive athletes. And uh, quite surprisingly, the, the vast majority of our colleagues use ECHO uh, in, uh, not only in symptomatic competitive athletes, but also in asymptomatic competitive athletes to uh, detect potential uh, anomalies that may uh, pose at risk of dying suddenly to our population of competitive athletes. And indeed, one of the main reasons why the colleagues declared to use ECO to complete the uh, pre-participation evaluation was the detection of the anomalous origin of coronary arteries. Indeed, in the 90s, uh, two pioneering studies demonstrated that it is possible to visualize the ostium of the right coronary artery, as well as the ostium, the left main coronary artery by ECHO in the vast majority of elite competitive athletes. And the presence of some abnormalities may be confirmed by advanced imaging and may uh, give the possibility uh, to diagnose an anomalous origin of uh, coronary artery. So in other terms, transthoracic echo may help physicians to suspect a coronary anomaly. When we perform uh, transthoracic echo in an artery, we should always use echo to detect potential coronary anomalies. And this approach, so the uh, need to visualize the ostium of the coronary arteries is mandatory in case of cardiac symptoms related with the force, such as chest pain, unexplained exceptional syncope or uh, presyncope. Then, uh, after the diagnosis of an anomalous, uh, anomalous origin of coronary arteries, we need to analyze the uh, to characterize the course of the anomalous coronary artery, as well as the we should define the presence or the absence of inducible myocardial uh, ischemia according to the ESC guidelines in order to. Uh, uh, evaluate whether the athlete may be considered eligible to sports practice or uh, or not, and may be eligible also to sports competitions. So in other terms, it means that we should use uh, advanced, uh, advanced imaging uh, 
And so again, we use ECG, we use quite often e ECHO, but in selected cases, we should use advanced imaging to analyze uh, in details the characteristics of our uh, individuals. And uh, we know that we have different imaging tools in sports cardiology, from ECHO to CMR, from nuclear imaging to corosity, from exercise stress CMR to exercise stress ECHO. So in other terms, we should carefully select the most appropriate imaging tool to diagnose uh, the presence of an anomalous uh, origin or coronary uh, artery anomalous course. The role of uh, cardiac magnetic resonance in the assessment of competitive athletes has dramatically increased in the last few years. And now we have also the possibility in uh, um, the centers with a great expertise to perform also CMR stress perfusion for the detection of inducible uh, ischemia. But unfortunately, CMR is able to see the ostium or the left and the right coronary arteries, but is not able to visualize the coronary cords in the vast majority of our, our individuals. That's the reason why the uh, cardiac computed tomography has a relevant role in sports cardiology. This is the latest publication from uh, our uh, research group highlighting the importance of this uh, advanced, advanced imaging technique in uh, sports cardiology. We should uh, focus our attention uh, in, on the use of cardiac CT in competitive athletes in two main fields. One is the field dedicated to young athletes and the other one is dedicated to master athletes. Regarding young athletes, Coro CT may help to uh, analyze uh, an and to visualize an anomalous origin of coronary artery as well as the uh, coronary course anomaly. Uh, and sometimes it may also detect the coronary uh, artery disease in this population. So in other terms, we may suspect the presence of uh, coronary uh, anomalies by transtragic echo, including not only uh, the anomalous origin, but also anomalous origin, um, such as the high takeoff of coronary artery. And then we should use CT to confirm the coronary uh, anomaly of, in terms of origin, as well as to characterize in details the course of this uh, coronary, uh, uh, coronary artery. And then we have the great opportunity by coro CT to visualize the uh, intramyocardial course of a coronary artery. And according to the uh, anatomic characteristics of the coronary artery, we may understand whether the myocardial bridging is deep or not. And so we may understand whether it may uh, induce myocardial ischemia or not in our population. Then the second chapter is dedicated to ischemic heart disease. And unfortunately, ischemic heart disease is uh, relatively frequent also in the population of young athletes. Indeed, our meta-analysis uh, uh, recently demonstrated that ischemic heart disease is frequent in young athletes, but its uh, prevalence is higher in uh, non-athletes, so in sedentary uh, individuals posing the problem of the screening also in this specific population. And unfortunately, the uh, cardiovascular uh, risk of uh, Olympic and top level athletes is also underestimated because this lipidemia and increased increase waist circumference is relatively common in elite athletes with the ex exception of athletes practicing endurance discipline. And a minority of individuals presents also a high cardiovascular uh, risk related to modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. So again, now we have the opportunity to use uh, different imaging tools. And again, we have the opportunity to use also uh, uh, Im imaging tools that may um, provide information about uh, stress so functional information such as exercise echocardiography that may be useful for the evaluation of global and regional cardiac function during exercise in cases of suspected coronary artery disease or coronary uh, artery anomalies. And beyond this field, the exercise ego has also the opportunity to assess contractile reserve of dilated ventricles with mild impairment of systolic function, 
difficulty in endurance uh, athletes, or to provide relevant information about the changes of the hemodynamics in many athletes with valvular heart disease. This test relies in terms of uh, detection of myocardial ischemia on the uh, ischemic cascade uh, in with that um, uh, in which we can see that perfusion abnormalities, diastolic dysfunction, strain abnormalities, and systolic uh, dysfunction occur uh, earlier as compared to ECG abnormalities or to the presence of symptoms such as angina. And this is one case in which the uh, acoustic window is very good and we may uh, understand what is happening in the beginning of the exercise to our athlete and before the uh, the peak of exercise and then at the peak of exercise we can clearly see that the function of the left ventricle is completely normal and normal motion anomalies are identified by this test in this specific individual however once again sometimes this uh, test is not enough and it's better to complete the examination by a ct or even to perform directly a uh, coro ct such as particularly in master athletes with an intermediate probability of ischemic heart disease. In this specific field, CT is very useful to detect the presence, of course, of coronary artery disease, but then also to uh, quantify the calcium score, to assess the cardiovascular risk profile of our individuals, and then to provide prognostic information for uh, master athletes. So, in other terms, we have different imaging techniques with different pros and cons and with different sensitivity and specificity. And so according to the characteristics of which imaging technique is very uh, useful to select the appropriate test to diagnose the presence of a coronary artery anomaly or to, to detect the presence of ischemic heart disease. This is one case uh, about a master athlete, a very fit, uh, 75 uh, uh, years uh, old Caucasian, uh, 65, sorry, uh, male Caucasian competitive runner running marathons that is completely asymptomatic at the time of the evaluation with no cardiovascular risk factors and normal cholesterol and normal blood pressure values. This is his resting ECG, and we may uh, clearly see the presence of diffuse T-wave inversion from V1 to, to V6. We may suspect, for instance, in a young individual, the presence of a cardiomyopathy, but we are talking about the master athlete, and then this suspicion should be first in this case, the presence of a coronary artery disease that is asymptomatic in this specific individual. And then if the uh, pre-participation evaluation is performed uh, regularly, for instance, yearly, we may compare the resting ECG with the previous one. And indeed the resting ECG collected one year before was completely normal. And so we can see that no T-way inversion is present in the precordial leads in this uh, individual. Then we performed ECHO first, and the ECHO was completely normal. So ECHO demonstrated a normal biventricular function, normal biventricular dimensions with a mild left ventricular hypertrophy that should be not responsible for this uh, repolarization abnormalities, no more motion abnormalities, and no barbara heart disease. So what to do, which is the best test to, uh, to indicate and to prescribe in our uh, master athletes, we decide to perform in this specific case, a coro CT, and the coro CT demonstrated spot decalcification uh, on the right coronary artery, but then a diffuse disease of the uh, left uh, coronary artery, in particular with the left anterior descending artery with a stop at the proximal uh, LAD. And so we perform coronary angiography that confirmed the presence of a quite normal and dominant right coronary arteries, but unfortunately, a, a clear stop of the LLAD. And so in this case, we decided to uh, perform a PCI. There was a complex revascularization. Indeed, the PCI was performed uh, on the septal as well as the diagonal uh, LAD with a mini crush uh, technique. And then we uh, observed a subsequent occlusion uh, of the uh, first diagonal that is relatively common in this complex uh, 
uh, anatomies. And then after our final casing balloon, we obtained a good result. And this is the final result after the uh, PCI in our, uh, in our patient. Then uh, the uh, therapy was uh, administered, and then we decided to uh, use double antiplatelet therapy, ramipril and uh, robustanin. Uh, but then what about uh, sports uh, competition? So according to the complex anatomy and complex revascularization of this individual, given also the age, we decided to uh, stop this individual from sports uh, competitions. And then we uh, prescribed according to the uh, CPET results, we uh, prescribed a tailored uh, program of exercise with a clear definition of the intensity of aerobic exercise based on the heart rate. And so we give the possibility to this individual to practice sports and to practice uh, exercise uh, with a uh, tailored and defined intensity of aerobic exercise. So to summarize, coronary artery abnormalities in athletes includes not only ischemic heart disease, but also the anomalous course and origin of coronary uh, artery. And this is particularly true for uh, young individuals. So we should pay attention to the different population that we are evaluating. Uh, ECHO may help physicians to suspect coronary uh, anomalies uh, and particularly the anomalous course and origin of coronary arteries, particularly in case of cardiac symptoms and symptoms related, related with the effort. However, translogic ECHO is not enough in suspected case. And so in selected case, we should uh, use and indicate core OCT and advanced imaging uh, stress testing. However, imaging techniques should be carefully selected because they are different. They have different sensitivity and specificity and different characteristics. And we should select this, the, these techniques uh, carefully to obtain their best performance to detect coronary artery disease. So thank you for your attention. Okay, so I'd like to welcome back our speakers from our panel discussion. First of all, thank you very much. They were fantastic talks. So let's start with the discussion. Professor Sharma, I have a very controversial question from the audience. So should sports bodies, organization, organizers stop anticoagulated athletes competing in collision sports, or should this be the athlete's informed choice? May I ask you to unmute yourself? Sorry. Uh, classic, classic uh, error to start with. So apologies. Um, I'm, a, I'm a great advocate for athlete autonomy. You know, um, I think um, we need to discuss the pros and cons of of such practice. You know, cycling vigorously with uh, with anticoagulants on board and risking, you know, head injuries and maybe even an intracerebral bleed, or even you know a, a hematoma in the leg during a football game or something like that. And I think we need to talk about the pros and cons and. Uh, you know, obviously involve the athlete in that decision. I don't think that we should be mandating against, uh, you know, these types of sports. We don't we don't seem to necessarily prevent athletes with cardiac diseases from competing. You know, people with Wolf, Parkinson, White exercise, people with ICDs exercise and compete. So I think it'd be uh, we'd have to we have to uh, apply the same things for athletes who are anticoagulants and uh, think about that clearly. Having said that, there may be certain organisations uh, who who may be empowered enough to stop athletes from uh, from with with with, with anticoagulants to exercise in their particular organisations. Lovely. I have another question from the audience. So, what are your what what are the current recommendations for sports in athletes with AF and MS? So, this is a question from Faris Ahmed and Mohammed Sharif. Well, atrial fibrillation is, I mean, I did say in my talk that it's not necessarily a very benign rhythm disturbance, but it's its rarely associated with a sudden cardiac death. And in, in individuals who've got a structurally normal heart uh, and who tolerate um, AF, and these are people that have had exercise stress tests where we've actually been able to identify their maximal heart rate and exclude ischemia, if they tolerate the AF, and if they've got a chance VAS score of zero, i.e., they probably don't need anticoagulation, then the recommendation say they can participate in all sport. Uh, clearly, uh, the one thing that um, you know um, is an issue is is anticoagulants, and if someone's anticoagulant, anticoagulant, we do advise against collision sport. Uh, 
I have one other question for you. So the safety of flaconide as a pill in the pocket approach, are there any you know, specific concerns with exercise? Should we be giving some kind of tips to our athletes when they're taking flaconide? What's your what's your take on that? I mean, flaconide is, is a satisfactory drug as a pill in the pocket approach. And the athlete develops atrial fibrillation. It's persisted for 20 or 30 minutes. They take 100 milligrams of flaconide. And, and 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 you know hopefully it may cardiovert them if it doesn't a couple of late two or three hours later they may take some more the issue really with flecainide is that during rapid heart rates it can convert atrial fibrillation to atrial flutter which has this propensity to maybe even develop causing one-to-one -one conduction putting someone into ventricular flutter and ventricular fibrillation so we don't like to use flecainide as monotherapy to, to prevent AF, it's okay as a pill in the pocket. And once someone has taken it, we do like them to refrain from exercise until at least two half lives have passed. So I say almost two days before they can start exercising vigorously again. Okay, I'm gonna give you a break because there's lots of lots more questions for you, but I'm gonna move on to Rachel. Rachel, um, my question to you is, do you routinely do an exercise test on your patients with a device? And, you know, what do you look look out for and what tips would you give to your uh, physiologist who is supervising the exercise test or from, from a pacing per, a pacing perspective? Well, so from the defibrillator perspective, we, we would definitely put some. So there's two separate questions. There's the defibrillator patient and the pacemaker patient. So for the defibrillator patient, we put them on a treadmill for a couple of reasons. One is uh, in evaluation of how well controlled their underlying arrhythmias are to see that they're not going to be having um, arrhythmias with exercise. And the second is to make sure that their sinus rate is not going to uh, be higher than the rate cut off for therapy. Um, particularly in a young patient who is going to get a very high sinus rate. Our studies show that it's safe to program these devices with pretty high rate cutoffs, but you want to still make sure that your um, that your that the uh, the athlete's sinus rate is not going to exceed the rate cutoff. Okay. And um, how often do you follow your athletes up with devices? Do, is do you do you have a time limit when, as to when you want to see them? Well. In the days in our current era of remote monitoring, that's taken care of a lot of the follow-up questions. So for someone who's on remote monitoring, um, you know, wire, particularly wireless remote monitoring, which, which uh, most ICDs do have now, um, we're not going to miss a lead problem, um, you know, something like that. We're going to know if they've had an arrhythmia. So I don't, I, in general, when someone's first going back to exercise, I would want to see them sort of as they're getting into it and see how things are going. But once they're in a stable pattern, assuming they do have wireless remote monitoring, then um, we can often just see them at, at a regular uh, device interval. And what are, what are your thoughts on the accuracy of wearables? You know, we often get asked in our sports cardiology clinic, what do you think, doctor? Shall I, have, shall I get myself a garment? Shall I get myself an apple? You know, what is your what is your advice on all these wearables that, you know, people can buy and, you know, potentially they're fairly expensive on the market. So what's your take, Rachel? So I, I think the wearables, I don't know, are we talking about device patients or in, in general? It, or it, in both, in general. Yeah. In general. So I think the wearables are a two-edged sword. I think for certain patients, they can be extremely helpful. Um, if patients have symptoms and they're not sure and they would otherwise have to go to an ER, perhaps someone with atrial fibrillation, not sure is he in it, he's not in it, um, they can be very helpful save patients trips to a, a, an emergency room. Um, on the other hand, there are some patients who... Um, develop a, a lot of sort of somatization, um, focus, um, somatic, uh, I should say somatic focus. And I think that the wearables can really increase that and increase health anxiety. So I think you really have to be very careful and sort of talk to the patients so that they don't feel that they are supposed to be checking their, their heart, you know, their heart rates and rhythms, you know, every five minutes. Fantastic. Thank you. Nabil, welcome and Thank you. fantastic slides as always. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for you. So what do you think is the most important aspect of management of an athlete with myocarditis? Yeah, so um, so thanks again for inviting me to be here. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit late to joining. So I, I personally think one of, for, for me, from my experience of seeing athletes, one of the, the most important things is somebody's had myocarditis or suspected of having myocarditis is to get them to rest the heart. I think that can be one of the most challenging things to do in an athlete is to get them to actually stop exercising and not just for a short period of time but we're talking about at least three months um, 
certainly after a confirmed case of myocarditis and potentially even longer. And, and I, I sort of can't emphasise that enough, that, that resting the heart is so important because, uh, as you probably saw from the talk, there is data that, you know, exercising with active myocarditis is, is certainly detrimental and it can not only lengthen the disease, but also also worsen it as well. So I think that is really, really important, um, sort of resting the heart. And then obviously the other aspects are, are you know, in the fulminant acute cases where, you know, there's really bad heart failure is trying to quickly determine the etiology and what's causing it, because there are some conditions that, you know, in the acute phase will be very amenable to certain treatments. So, for example, giant cell myocarditis and, and steroids, etc. So, on the other hand of the spectrum, where people are really unwell with a very, very florid disease, I think a myocard endomyocardial biopsy and, and looking for an etiology is, is really important so that, you know, um, uh, treatment can be started promptly. Okay. There's a question from the audience, Nabil, that uh, on on grading ca cardio exercise, I presume they mean endurance exercise in post-COVID myocarditis, especially when we identify these subtle regions of fibrosis in the basal and infralateral wall. And the, uh, the person who's posed this question is, is asking what you do in the, these situations when your patient is on evabradine. Do you have any take on that? So sorry, just clarify the question. So patients on evabradine and patients on evabradine, and you identify subtle fibrosis in their LV myocardium. Uh, how do you how do you grade their cardio exercise? What advice do you give them? So in terms of then this is post myocarditis, is it? Post. -COVID. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think with somebody who's got scarring in the in the heart, I think you just have to you have to be very careful. You have to keep 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 continue to follow them up regularly. The guidelines would say that, you know, if they're scarring and particularly if scarring along with LV dysfunction, they should not participate in high intensity exercise. I, I personally think that's a, a little bit unfair and I, I think they have to be they have to be watched carefully. I think if they're starting to go back to exercise, you can fit them with wearable monitors, as we've just been talking about, to look for any evidence of arrhythmias. And I think, yeah, in terms of the grading, they should probably just start off gently. So there's different ways that we can do that. You can you can grade exercise in terms of uh, using cardiopulmonary exercise uh, tests in terms of the you know the the, the, the uh, percentage um, VO2, but also in terms of their percentage heart rate uh, that they reach. So there's various ways that we can do that. Um, but I think anything they do. They should start off gently, and I think you just just have to make sure that we follow them up quite closely if there is any scarring in the heart. I have seen cases of people with myocarditis who had an athlete, you know, a few months ago who had been getting palpitation, um, stopped playing a football match, sat down on the floor, sort of brief episode of syncope, had an MRI which was suggestive of myocarditis, um, but nothing on the halter. We then put him on the exercise test and you develop, you develop sustained VT. So um, I think you just have to be very, very careful from that perspective. Perfect. Flavio, um, great talk again. So how useful is an echo for the identification of the coronary ostea? And have you got any tips for the our echo physiologists when they are scanning, you know, young people and we're looking for these anomalies? Yes, thank you, Sabia, for, for the question. I believe that it's essential to visualize the, the ostium of the right coronary artery as well, of course, of the ostium of the left coronary artery by ECHO, particularly if the ECHO is per performed for the first time in a young individual, and particularly if the uh, artery is symptomatic, for instance, for for uh, angina or had a syncope or a syncope during the, the effort. Now, with the with an appropriate setting, with the new ego machines, it's possible to see the ostium really in more than 90% of the young individuals. However, we may have the the cases in which we are not able to clearly see the ostium. In that case, particularly if the the young athlete is symptomatic, we may evaluate the possibility to complete the examination by uh, by corosity. However, in the vast majority of the cases, it's possible with an appropriate setting to see at least the, the ostium of the, the coronary arteries. Okay. And do you have a specific protocol for your for your stress echoes that you apply for your athletes in Italy? 
Oh yes, the, the most important thing uh, to do is, in my uh, personal opinion, is to have a continuous monitoring of the heart conditions. So, I mean, it is essential to perform the stress echo during the and the monitoring by echo during the entire examination, not just at the peak of exercise. And in most of the cases, it is important to to perform the examination with a better uh, ergometer. And that is essential to to have a clear visualization of the heart in in an athlete. We may have not the peak of exercise because uh, cycling on the the bed ergometer is not so so easy for for the athlete. But it's, it's, it is essential, for instance, in athletes with with valvular heart disease, in which we would like to see the the behavior of the valvular heart disease during the exercise, and we would like to for instance, to measure the uh, pulmonary pressures. Lovely, thank you. Sanjay, can I come back to you? So you said in your talk, uh, women are protected from AF with exercise compared to males. The question is, why is that? And then I've got another question from the audience uh, where they've said, oh, you showed a graph that intensive exercise in females has a protective effect to AF. Does this also include our postmenopausal women? Very good points. Um, Certainly the meta-analyses that we have uh, available to us at the moment seem to suggest that uh, women are protected from atrial fibrillation. If we look at the, you know, 400,000 odd biobank from the UK, uh, we've shown that if you look at people who exercise according to the current recommendations or three times the current recommendations, so we're not talking about our elite athletes, you know, both men and women are protected, but the, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is even lower in women you know, exercising at those levels than in men. If we look at the meta-analyses, and that was quite a, a large data set, we see that, you know, if women uh, exercise very vigorously, they reduce their risk of AF by 28%. Now, it's true to say that uh, women age um, less quickly than men when it comes to the cardiovascular system. Uh, you know, if I put a figure on it, they probably age about 10 years after men age. So if we're going to compare like for like, maybe what we should be doing is comparing women who are about 10 years older than men. Uh, there is certainly an emerging population of women ever present at ultra endurance marathon events and all sorts. And they are, they are probably the highest rising group of athletes at the moment. So there is certainly plenty of opportunity to do that. But my own experience, um, uh, and this is only a small number, N equals 160, of healthy post-menopausal post women, women who've been assessed in detail, uh, does not show an increased prevalence of atrial fibrillation in this cohort. Now, what's the reason behind this? Several, and, and without uh, causing offense, it could be that women haven't been exercising as vigorously as men for as long a period. You know, obviously there was a time where only men entered such races. And you know, this, this women, women presence is now quite florid, but it wasn't the case, say, 25 years ago. So that's one possibility. The second possibility is that clearly they've been protected by their estrogens for quite a long time. So their total peripheral resistance may be less. Their blood pressure responses may be more favorable. They are probably more likely to listen to their bodies and not push themselves too hard if they become symptomatic. And of course, they don't have that anabolic steroids that's, that's endogenous in men that causes hypertrophy and does cause scarring. So there are plenty of potential mechanisms why women may be more protected than men. Well, that's good to know. Oh, Rachel, we're going to be all right, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, another question for you from the audience. So um, are there any restrictions in uh, for athletes with AF in hot environments? Can endurance sport in heat turn AF into VF in asymptomatic athletes? I can't answer that question accurately um uh, but you know obviously af you know we would we would only recommend that people that af exercise vigorously if their ventricular rate is not completely in uncontrolled uh, and not getting to a point where it may be causing other ventricular arrhythmias uh, I, I i i mean obviously theoretically it's possible that you know if you're dehydrated and if you've got you know if you've got ongoing, if you've got concomitant atrial flutter as well, if you're pushing yourself very, very hard, that you could run into trouble. But I've, I've got to be very cautious when I say that because there isn't enough evidence to suggest that uh, as, as we know at the moment. Rachel, um, just going back to the female athlete, is there any data in female athletes and devices that you can potentially share with us? <laughs> 
Um, our study of athletes was about two thirds male, um, but we did not see any differences between men and women. Um, the, the, the types of um, underlying heart diseases that they have, the risk of um, arrhythmias is often similar. Um, and so we did not see differences between men and women. Great. Nabil, um, there's a question from the audience. Resting for three to six months is pretty long post-myocarditis. This could decondition the athlete, longer return to and longer return to sport. Is there a maximal heart rate that they could reach to avoid deconditioning? Um, I mean, I think this is, a, again, a difficult one. I think anything low intensity, really, um, you know, not more than 55 percent of their, their, their predicted target heart rate would be fine. But for most people, that will be confined to things like walking. Um, you know, I, I understand that the, the concerns that athletes have with decon deconditioning and almost starting from scratch, coming back from an illness like this. But I think, you know, it is so important. I guess one thing that we do do is look at cases on a case case by case basis and, and you know, looking at how severe the, the, the disease was. So that's potentially sort of one route where, you know, the cardiologist discusses with them. Um, so, for example, if there's, you know, they've had a clear myocarditis, a, a troponin rise, but only a small amount of scar. But the, the problem is there's still inflammation and edema there. So it can be difficult. I certainly wouldn't recommend them going back to any any degree of meaningful exercise for at least three months and then reassessing at that point, to be honest. And yes, if they decondition in, in that in that in that time, uh, it, it is it is a a big problem for professional athletes, but unfortunately, I don't think there really is an alternative. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Flavia, last question to you. So in patients with ischemic heart disease, um, when are they no longer eligible for sports participation or sports competition? What would you say? <clears throat> well, I believe that one of the main aim of sports psychology is not only to to prevent sudden death, that is an essential aim, of course, but is also to prescribe exercise in these individuals. I mean, not only in patients with ischemic heart disease, but also in mainly in patients with cardiomyopathies, for instance, with, with uh, uh, hypertrophic uh, mm -hmm. cardiomyopathy. And in that case, it is important, however, to, to, to prescribe exercise in a very targeted manner. And we have the opportunity, for instance, to use cardiopulmonary exercise testing for identifying the ventilatory thresholds. And so in other terms, to identify the intensity of aerobic exercise in a very specific manner, taking into account the uh, personal characteristics and, uh, of the patients as well as their, uh, the therapy that they are um, that, that is administered. And one important point is that if we perform uh, exos an exercise prescription in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we may use not only cardiopulmonary exercise testing, but mainly cardiopulmonary exercise testing combined with exercise ego, maybe in that case using a cycle ergometer to identify whether the patient suffering from, is, uh, from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has an obstruction at the level of the left ventricle. Uh, out, left ventricular outflow tract. Lovely, thank you. I'd like to thank our speakers. I really have asked you a lot of difficult questions and I would like to, we are going to finish up early and so I'd like to hand over to Dr. James Hull um, who will, uh, ha who has some closing remarks. James. Well thank you very much Deesa Abbey um, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, close this uh, uh, conference. It's been a fantastic uh, day. The pulmonary sessions were very, very good indeed. Um, I was remarking to Sabi earlier that the uh, pulmonary speakers arrive in track suits and the cardiologists, of course, always outdress us with lovely suits and ties, but it's probably the state of play with pulmonary medicine, I think. Um, but I really enjoyed and learned a huge amount from the cardiology sessions as well. Um, and I think um, speaking to Matt's comments in the opening part of the conference, I hope it really reinforces the place of the ICH in terms of our keen interest, not only in the musculoskeletal issues concerning athlete health, but also about the importance of general uh, health and particularly, of course, pulmonary and cardiac conditions. And so um, you have the contact details uh, for the ICH that Matt shared at the start. We're very keen to hear from you if you have any further questions, um, concerns, um, please reach out to us. 
our clinical staff are always very help, very happy to answer questions and provide clinical advice and support, and indeed, of course, to see patients and provide screening services. So um, that probably brings to a close. Finally, thing to say thank you to the organising committee, um, particularly Kelly, who's done a great job. I think you'll agree in uh, setting this conference up and the programmes and materials. Um, and also thank you, of course, to the host broadcaster for this service. So. I'll probably leave it there. Thank you again to everybody. And I look forward to seeing you hopefully in person next year for the conference in 2023. Thank you very much indeed.